right thing can sometimes feel like the wrong thing if it's not you going above and beyond and just sacrificing everything for that person. But again, that's that's where it comes back to it's a trauma response because that's not logical. Welcome to Velvet Ventures, where we talk about life, marriage, and the pursuit of entrepreneurship. I'm Ben. And I'm Channing. This episode is brought to you by Mix and Mingle Business Networking. Are you ready to expand your business network and make meaningful connections? Look no further than Mix and Mingle Business Network. And we can personally say how great of a benefit they are, especially for small businesses. We attend them personally. In fact, we even lead a few of the chapters, so we hope to see you there. For more information about Mix and Mingle, you can check out the link below this episode. Still run a successful business. Gotcha. So... And mainly just because I am a people pleaser. I heard an interesting theory the other day. They said that most people pleasing, it's more a trauma response than it is like a personality, like a character quality. It's more a trauma response. So if you've been through trauma or if you've been in a relationship with a narcissist, you are more likely to be a people pleaser. I think I read something that was similar to that, that, yeah, it's basically, a lot of times it comes from childhood trauma, so what that is, I think, varies, but yeah, that's all that. Yeah. So, I am a people pleaser, and it's probably from both those <laughs> situations, um, but it can, it has been, and it still can be, very difficult to operate a business because of that fact. And so I wanted to talk about, as a non-people pleaser, some of your tips that you've given to me in the past, and then just kind of run through some things that I do now, today, to help me run more successfully and not feel as bad. Sure. Because I think not everybody has, like, I mean, my first tip would be find somebody that's not a people pleaser and let them be your accountability partner. That'd be my first thing. So whether that's a coach, a mentor, a friend, a family member, a spouse, somebody else that is not a people pleaser to bounce ideas off of, because there's some times when I'll come to you and I feel like I'm being completely just, I'm not thinking of the other person. I'm just being selfish. And you're like, no, you're being completely logical. And this is how you should handle the situation. Now, the wording of those things is what we run through (laughs) together. Right. But I think not, I think most people pleasers probably don't have that kind of person or realize that they need that kind of person right. in their corner. Yeah, I think it's more of a, they don't realize they need it or they choose not, not to have it because they don't like that confrontation of someone telling them, this is how you should do this or recommendations because I don't think it's about being bossy and telling them how they need to do it, but advising them on, you know, you're either in the right or you're in the wrong, you know, or they're in the wrong. And so how do you advise them in a way that, you know, is going to be beneficial for everybody, but is also going to keep, keep you safe and keep that relationship intact. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, as kids were taught to put others first, A lot, you know, like you should be thinking, you shouldn't be thinking of yourself. You need to think of others. You need to think of others. And so when you combine that as a people pleaser, doing the right thing can sometimes feel like the wrong thing if it's not you going above and beyond and just sacrificing everything for that person. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, that's where it comes back to, it's a trauma response because that's not logical. But so some, I guess, give me again, or maybe it'll be new information. What are the top two things that you see me people pleasing on and what would be two points that you would redirect me in those instances? Oh, okay. Um, you know, some of the things that you people please on is, you know, specifically like if a client or somebody comes and, you know, hires you or wants to work with you and they, maybe they didn't understand the contract or maybe they didn't understand you know, the scope of work and they kind of come back and say like, well, Hey, I thought you were going to do this and not always, but sometimes you'll, you know, 
go to meet their need, which is great, but you also, basically, it's it kind of falls into that once you give certain people an inch, they'll, they'll take a mile. Mm-hmm. And not to say that everybody's like that, not to say that maybe, it, you know, they may be correct in thinking that, well, in a conversation we had, you said that I would be getting X or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that they're wrong and you're right or that they're right and you're wrong. It's about managing those expectations and and communicating and walking through them as thoroughly as possible. But also when things go awry, which as business owners, they will, um, you know, it's how do you handle that and not give them everything that they want just because they're pushing back, mm-hmm. you know, because... There are people out there who are just looking for a deal. They'll agree to something, get halfway through, and then they'll ask for more, but feel like that should fall under the original scope of work. Mm-hmm. And when, well, especially with my like ADHD as well, me going the extra mile, it might take eight minutes or it might take eight hours. But to me, there's times when that doesn't feel any different. Mm-hmm. The eight hours feels like eight minutes. Right. And I'll turn around and go, oh my gosh, I just lost a you know a full day of productivity in these other areas that needed my attention, just trying to appease this one person. Yeah. You know, going back to the table and doing three extra edits right. when in the contract it only says one. Right. And then still ending with wanting more, wanting more, wanting more. Right. Well, I think that that's where it can be important, depending on what your business is. Um, you know, I think it can be, it's very important that you figure out what your pay structure is. You know, do you complete all your work before, you, you know, before you get paid? Are you taking a deposit? Are you on a retainer? Because, you know, to me, especially if you're doing a more elaborate work, especially if it's creative, mm-hmm. because there's expectations that... That's so subjective. Right. The client has... They have this idea of what they're going to get. You have a different idea because you're in it all day. So, like, you may think, well, this is perfectly fine. This is, you know, this is great and blah, blah, blah. But they may have had this, like, Pinterest-esque idea of what they would be getting. And so I think it can be important that, you know, you have your initial conversations and say, like, maybe it's a paid consultation to where you know, this will be applied to your bill. Mm -hmm. But this way, maybe you can kind of figure out like one, you get a little bit of money that is going to pay for your initial presentation work, proposal, whatever. But then once that gets applied, like you've already done some of the work. So it all is fine, but at least this way you're not, you know, agreeing to this amount. You're blocking off a certain amount of time out of your monthly schedule to do this work, or you're having somebody else, um, you know, contracted to do it. And then, you know, you get halfway through or you get completely through and they're not happy mm-hmm. or, you know, you get halfway through and they decide, Oh, okay, well this isn't really the direction we were thinking. Can you redo it? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, well, well, what do you do? Do you redo it? You know, or is it like, yeah, we can redo it, but you know, that's now going to take up, half of your budget because now we're redoing half of the work. Right. So I think that that's, you know, that, that's an important thing to help mitigate that as a people pleaser. Yeah. I mean, for me now, dowry doesn't start work outside of like our CRM. We don't start work without a signed proposal. And we have contracts for everything. And now that's not to say like this is a long term contract that requiring them to stay with us as a client, but it's a contract saying, and it's on the bottom of our invoices now, depending on what type of project, but this is the exact scope of work. We are not guaranteeing results. We, you know, we recommend you stay with this plan for four to six months or whatever the case may be to see results. Kind of like your doctor. Your doctor's not going to say go to the gym once. And then if if something doesn't happen, come back and, you know, I'll give you your money back for that recommendation. 
Um, but it's so important as a people pleaser for me to have a contract because that gives me the the logic behind because the emotions can take over to say like, here was the scope of work. You, we went over the contract and you signed it. Whether you read everything in there is not my responsibility, not my obligation. I completed above and beyond the scope of work because I'm still people pleasing in the middle. But it's very clear that this is how this situation is going to work. And so it doesn't make it any more fun. Like I still really struggle sending emails because I don't like when people are not happy because I'm a people pleaser. And so when I have to send emails that say like, sorry, we're not going back to the drawing board under this original budget or, you know, here's the world. I can give you these seven other things, but your contract is non-refundable. The work has already been completed. So I'll go above and beyond. Here's three other ways that I'm willing to give you your desired outcome, but we can't refund because the work has already been done. Right. And that is still a very tough conversation, and I don't like doing it at all. It takes up a lot of mental space. But if I hadn't have had the contract, that's not even a conversation that I could have had. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that's just shows the importance of having having a contract and having those those elements of protection because yeah. you know if if you don't if you don't have those it's not to say that you know you're screwed but it 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 will take you think it takes up a lot of mental space now if you didn't have those things in place it would take up a lot more mental space right. um, cuz we also record all our zoom meetings where we're meeting with clients and that's not as like a, Ooh, gotcha at the end. Right. Honestly, we use it to review to make sure we understand what the expectation of the client is before we send out a proposal. So as we're going through and saying, okay, here's the game plan for this client. We review that video to make sure we're not missing anything or that we, we didn't hear something the first time. But as a people pleaser, sometimes I go back through those videos just to, to make sure that I didn't, falsely portray something to make sure that I didn't say something that I didn't deliver on. And so that also helps me sleep better at night because I can know, like I'm not shoving the video in the client's face, but I can know that I did exactly what I said I was going to do in exactly the way I said I was going to do it. And I build according to those facts. And then I went above and beyond. And so I'm not a bad person because that's what it feels like when you let people down as a people pleaser. It feels like I am such a bad person. I'm so selfish. How dare I think of me and not give them everything that they want? Yeah. Well, I think also, you know, some of this is just about holding yourself accountable. And I think that, you know, whatever that realm may be, just if it's going to the gym, you got to hold yourself accountable to go or, doing X, Y, and Z, like it's holding yourself accountable. And I think that this is a very similar realm where you're holding yourself accountable to what you said Mm -hmm. you were going to do. And that may not always be the most fun thing because it's just like with parenting or something, you know, you have to follow through with the discipline. Right. And that's not fun, but it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. And then you just learn from it because I think that at the end of the day, you know, if you're able to say, and this was the one thing that I think I wasn't as clear on. Mm-hmm. Here's how I'm going to solve that. Mm-hmm. And so looking at it from an objective standpoint of, you know, where was the lines of communication crossed? Where, because like, you know, you know what you're doing. And so in your mind, you see it. And so when you're explaining it, it may not be as detailed as someone who doesn't see it needs it to be. Right. And so in your mind, you completely explained it down to the, to the letter. But in reality, you know, whether it's, they don't want to sound like they don't know. So they're not going to actually say like, well, this doesn't make sense. Or they don't want to ask questions because they may be somewhat people pleasers too. And just want you to think like you're the best, Mm -hmm. you know, so they don't question what it is that you're doing. Right. And so. I think being able to step away and say, you know, where was the gap Mm -hmm. and what can I do next time? What can I include in a contract? What can I include in my, 
you know, my bid breakdown or whatever that may be, because it, it may seem silly to you. Cause I know for me, you know, I mean, doing like wood projects, you wouldn't think you'd have to say like, this wood is coming unfinished or this wood is coming with a clear coat. Cause like we discussed that, right? but like, you put that in there, Mm -hmm. how it's going to be finished, what's going to be visible, Mm -hmm. what's going to, you know, what, how's it going to be fastened together? So, I mean, you really need to do all those little nuances, even though as the executor, you know, it seems silly because it's like, well, that's implied. Right. It's like, well, it's implied to you, you know? And so I think that being conscious of when, when we're doing that or when we're talking to clients that we are, you know, we're explaining this to someone who possibly has no idea. So mm-hmm. Alex Hermosi says you should never write anything above a sixth grade reading level. Yeah. So you should be able to give it to a sixth grader and they should no matter what the concept is, right. the f- sixth grader should be able to figure it out. Yeah. And if they can't figure it out, then you're not explaining it simply enough. Mm-hmm. And I love that because I think sometimes people use like insurance does this a lot. <laughs> they use really complicated language as a means, and sometimes it's just, this is what the word is, but then there's no explanation. And I think sometimes that's just a a lack of recognition that the general population doesn't understand what this word means. And other times I think it's a superiority complex. They like that other people don't know what it means. And so you have to think of everything like that. Like yeah. If a sixth grader can't understand this, then I'm not explaining it detailed enough. Right. And, you know, I've just learned to start saying, like, bear with me. I'm going to over-explain this because I want to make sure that we're all clear. Right. And I'm, I'm never shocked when somebody, I think, would have understood a specific concept and this is new information for them. And so it just makes me glad that I took the time to over-explain it because otherwise they wouldn't have seen the value. They wouldn't have understood the proposal when that came out. Or if they'd already hired us, they wouldn't understand the scope of work that we're about to complete and why it matters. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people, they hide behind their, um, their knowledge of their trade or their business. They hide behind those fancy words or Mm -hmm. jargon to make them feel special and to make them seem more important than they are to maybe justify why they're charging what they charge Mm -hmm. or, you know, it makes them feel more exclusive. So maybe they are a better choice when in reality it's people want transparency. Like people won't make decisions when they don't understand. Yeah. No one says, man, I just, I do not understand what this menu item is because it's written in French, but I'm going to get it. No, you go to the thing that you see that's familiar. Right. Or the same meal every single time. Right. You know, where's the chicken tenders? And so, you know, I, I think that the misconception, and I think people are, a lot of people are getting away from it mm-hmm. because I think with just the flow of technology and people being able to readily consume information yeah, um, and people being able to share and people are more apt to share selling inside secrets or, you know, here's how to do X, Y, and Z. I think that people are more freely giving of that information these days. And so I think people are getting better. And so I'm hopeful in seeing that up uptick in transparency. But, you know, it, it, it should just come down to can we get along? Can we work together mm-hmm. as a client and somebody? You know, and so I think that as a people pleaser, you need to be very selective on who you work with. I know that's hard you know, when you're starting out, but like how much harder is it to work with 10 people and half of them end up wanting refunds or half of them don't ever pay mm-hmm. or, or half of them don't bad reviews or right. Like there's a hundred different things that they can do to hurt you. And it's like, was it worth it? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it hurts more and it may seem like you're making less progress because you have less you know, customers or, less interactions, but in reality, it's like, you know, you just, you need those, those good customers. And I know it's hard to vet in the beginning because you don't even as a, you know, especially as a new business, you probably don't know what your client is, Yeah. you know, or what your most ideal client is. And so mentorship. 
yeah, mentorship. And a lot of this is trial and error, but also it's, it's knowing I need to find people who I can interact with, who, you know, we can get along and I can see myself working with. If you start experiencing this, you know, constant pushback or, Hey, you know, your, your, your payment has bounced twice. Mm -hmm. We need a new form of payment for your next round. And so it's like, well, that's, that could be an honest mistake, but it also could just be a sign that, you know, they're not, yeah, they don't value your service. They're not making sure that you're taken care of Mm -hmm. because you're taking care of them by giving them, you know, what, what it is that they paid for, what they're, what we've agreed to. And if they're not valuing it enough to make sure that there are funds there or at least communicating right. and saying like, Hey, look, we just had a, had a vehicle repair on our work truck. So right. we're waiting for this payment to come in from this job. And so it'll be another week. Awesome. That's completely understandable. But when it's just, we, you know, if we have to chase you down month over month, you, you just may not be a good fit right now. And maybe it's just not a good fit and we don't want to continue chasing you down. We don't want to continue taking your money if you don't value what it is that we're providing. Yeah. You know, I mean, most of our companies operate on a basically no follow up basis. Right. Like we sit down, we, you know, for like for my insurance brokerage, for instance, I'll collect all your information. I'll get you a quote. I've got some people that turn in for a quote and I reach out a few times to book. I reach out twice to book the appointment. If they don't book the appointment, there's no sense in me hounding you to sit down for me to show you the quotes that I gathered right. because that just tells me open enrollment is going to be an absolute freaking nightmare when I have to get all 15 of your people's health information. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so on the gallery, it's kind of the same way. We'll sit down and we'll have a consultation. And sometimes those are very simple solutions and other times they're more abstract things that need to be accomplished to move the business forward. And we have a rule, you know, or not a rule, but we always say when they leave, okay, they, what's the next step? We say, send us your goal one, goal two, and goal three. That way we can show you, we can project what your proposals are going to be over the next three goal steps that you're wanting to accomplish. Because we want you to see what's around the corner. We don't want you to be surprised by what's coming. And there's been a few business owners that just never send it. That tells me that they don't value their growth enough. So why should I focus and lose sleep on it when they're not concerned about it? Right. And eventually, maybe they'll come back and send, hey, sorry, it took so long. This has happened. Totally fine. Right. Now we'll work and get a proposal. But I'm not going to sit here and worry and lose sleep and follow up and follow up. I'm not going to get lost in the follow up. Like, I'm willing to fight for those who are ready to fight for themselves, and I'm willing to go above and beyond in all those situations. But, yeah, I think it it's totally okay to fire a client, even though it doesn't feel like it. I just have to remind myself, like, it's okay to fire a client if they don't value, if they don't see the value in it. The last thing I want is somebody to feel like they got screwed over by any of our companies. Right. Introducing Lay and Turner Law Firm, Oklahoma's premier boutique law firm. Whether you're navigating complex immigration laws, starting a business, buying or selling property, planning your estate, or facing criminal charges, their dedicated team is here to fight for your rights. With a deep understanding of Oklahoma's legal landscape, Lay and Turner provide personalized solutions tailored to your unique situation. Contact Lay and Turner Law Firm today and let the people's attorney represent you. For more information about Lay Turner, there's a link below this episode. Well, and I think that that goes to with the follow-ups and stuff. You're by not pursuing them and hunting people down, like you're allowing other people to come. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think and giving as, the prospect space to think. Right. Well, and I just mean, you know, we we're when you're a small business owner, you're typically like when you're meeting with a client, subconsciously or consciously, you're thinking. They, they have a dollar value on them. Right. Like, regardless if you think about that or not, like, a dollar value is sitting in front of you, and you're thinking already, like, how am I going to use that in the business? Mm-hmm. How is this going to help move this forward? What, you know, how, what is this transaction, you know, going to allow the business to do? Like, what can I do for them? Mm-hmm. In return, what is this going to do on our side? Mm-hmm. 
And so I think it's always hard when someone doesn't follow up because you feel like you just lost that money. Mm-hmm. But in reality, it's... It makes time for new other people. Right. You're making space by not chasing them for the right people to come. Well, I think a lot of follow-up nowadays, it's turned into a manipulation tactic more right. than it has a genuine reminder for the client. Right. And so, like, one of the things that we did with the insurance brokerage is we automated a follow-up. And so, after the meeting, I tell people, like, here's the options. We do have deadlines based on the effective date that you've chosen. So, I'm going to email you all this stuff over with the deadlines that we have to meet. Otherwise, we have to re-quote most of the time. And most of the time, that means it can go up or down. It's very slight, typically, but you're going to see a difference in these proposals that I've set. So, in two weeks, my computer is going to reach out and just remind you if we haven't heard from you. But you don't feel like you have to answer. And the message even says, this is the computer. We just want to remind you. Don't feel like you have to respond. We just wanted to make sure that you had one last touch point. And so they know it's not me bugging and expecting a yes or a no. Like, I tell them, if it's a no, you just don't have to tell me. Right. Like, because I know some, I'm very... It's very hard for me to say no. And so I never want somebody to feel manipulated or pressured by any of our companies because I know how hard it can be for somebody to say no. And it then just ruins that relationship. Next time you see that person, you're like, oh, I don't want to be there. Yeah. They may say yes now, but it's actually a no. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's more about providing, I think, a a clear understanding of value mm-hmm. because you know i mean i i want i want a rolls royce but like i i i can't justify the value mm-hmm. because the value is not there for me right now mm-hmm. or i want you know this whole home automation system just because do i need it like no but i want it and so i think by creating that value and finding what is important to them you know because i mean I have clients too where on the home maintenance side that they want these things, but there's issues that stand there. It could be a price thing. It could be a, you know, it didn't get explained in the way that it's not just a, this product, but this product is also going to help with these things. And so I think sometimes it's, it's not just about, getting a yes or no answer, but it's about creating enough value to them where they don't have to, you know, sit there and think about it and think about it and think about it. And then you're like, Hey, just want to follow up and make sure like, do you still want to do this? And it's like, I mean, that's just lowering your level of expertise and, um, you know, your credibility because you're just chasing I just live in this world where I believe that everything that's supposed to happen will happen. And I, I realize I'm not the one in control. <laughs> right. And so there's, it's silly for me to sit here and just follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. You know, like, I mean, we have an offer on one of our companies and we're waiting on the other side to come back to the negotiation table. Like, I don't need that company to go away. Right. That company runs itself and it continues to produce, you know, 15% more, 20% more month over month over month right. with about two hours, maybe four hours of my week. I don't need it to go away. I don't yeah. need this offer. So why would I sit here and chase it down and take up mental space thinking about it when I need that mental space to focus on the companies that we're currently growing? Right. Like, would it be great? Absolutely. Would that ownership take care of those people and my clients? And would it be awesome? Maybe. But I won't know if it's what God has planned if I sit there and I force it. Right. And that's not to say you're not supposed to go out and work for things. Like, God's very clear that you're supposed to work hard for his glory. But that doesn't mean push and push and push and manipulate and follow up your clients to death. Like that is not what work hard means. Right. Well, and I think there's also a lot to be said about, um, providing space Mm -hmm. for the blessings. Right. You know, so if you stay busy doing follow-ups, you're probably not doing a lot of new reach outs. Mm -hmm. 
And so, and I think sometimes, you know, we're called to rest and, and sometimes in that rest is where the ideas come from the, you know, you may just be sitting there and saying, you know, I just, I don't, I don't feel like working right now or I want to take a TV break or a reading break. And then you finally, you took a break from pursuing or from being in it mm-hmm. and you know oh, two phone calls or two texts and saying hey we want to move forward with this yeah. or hey oh man I, I totally forgot you know that they were taught to them three weeks ago mm-hmm. and stuff and so you know or just current clients have more and more stuff and so I think that being diligent and being active mm-hmm. and working and sowing seeds um, is important but if you don't take a step back and and let those plants grow and you just keep watering them and watering them and watering them, like they're not going to grow. Right. But you need to get out of the way and let the sun hit them to let the seeds grow after you've done your part. Mm-hmm. And so I think that sometimes we just need to get out of our own way yeah. and let. Yeah. The insurance company actually grow, has grown more, more steadily. Yeah. I won't say like. Right. Massive scaling, but it has it has been more steady in the last year with me stepping back and just letting letting the automations do their thing and trusting I set it up properly and focusing on the things that I call focused to. That has grown more steadily this year than it did last year with eighteen months. Yeah. And last year it was me working hard, you know, mm-hmm. putting in eighty hours a week sometimes and working you know getting up at 3 a.m because i can't sleep and working all the way till 9 p.m and so now it's just me trusting that the work those seeds that i planted are finally coming to fruition i don't have to force them i just need to sit back accept them and then operate in the way that i know is morally right and ethical and the way that i believe that i'm supposed to run that company in the way that i'm supposed to treat those clients and As long as I do what's right and I just keep doing what's right, it's going to keep being the blessing that it's supposed to be. And that might not mean that it's national and it's multi-million dollar company. That might just mean that, you know, this pays our living. Right. Yeah. It it takes care of us. So at the end of the day, we get to be risky in all these other places because we know this basket, this parachute is going to be there when the bills need to be paid. Yeah. Well, I think people find it more, um, they're a little more apt to probably recommend you or your business when you are not a pushy, Mm -hmm. consistent um, pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if I have people who reach out to me constantly and stuff, like they may have done good work, but, Man, I'm just I'm just gonna tell you, dude. Like, I'll I'll give you the number to so and so, but they will be on you, mm-hmm. and they will text you constantly, or call you, or whatever. So, if that's not something that you want, like, don't even don't even go down that road. Mm-hmm. And so, I think that it's important to stay in front. And I think that's where the social media side comes in too, where that's how you stay in front of them. We're very pushy on social, and I say pushy as in. We are present. We are very present on social media. We average about nine posts a day for dowry. And I mean, honestly, with BHM, I've really not been posting like I should. I I post what I'm reading now. That's what I post about. Yeah. Um, Which is I'm doing a book a week challenge this year. Um, So I'm, I'm posting at least once a week, typically on BHM. But... Or if I see um, a story in the news about health insurance or if, like right now I have a client who I'm helping fight a claim. Um, and so sometimes I'll, I'll walk people through that as well. Um, but outside of that, it's just me genuinely showing up. It's not necessarily the company showing up. Yeah. Because people want to buy from people. They don't want to buy from a company. Right. And so showing who we are, showing what we are like outside of business, what we believe in. Um, that's what's going to get people to be 
your super fans or to be loyal, loyal, loyal and refer a ton of business. Right. Yeah. Well, I think especially whenever you're referring out of a posture of just genuine wanting to help versus, you know, am I going to get a referral fee out of this? Am I going to get something out of it? So I think that just being diligent and, and consistent in like your behavior, your motives, because, you know, if it gets towards the end of the month and you're trying to, you know, trying to make those quotas or trying to hit that number and you become more pushy, then you may, people may avoid you mm-hmm. come the last half of the month mm-hmm. or, you know, you get paid the first of the month from your company or, you know, you, you did well last month. So, you know, Oh, so-and-so is a lot of fun to be with for the first couple of weeks of the month, but then once the, you know, it starts getting down to the wire, don't, don't go hang out with so-and-so. Nobody else cares if you're trying to qualify for convention. Right. <laughs> yeah. No one, no one cares if you're trying to hit that bonus. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, yeah. So I, I believe that getting back to the people pleasing, all that being said, I mean, it's, it's so important to vet who you're working with. I think it's important to get an accountability partner of some kind. Um, contracts, and, contracts, contracts. And yeah, I mean, if you're, if you are someone who is, you know, controversy averse, mm-hmm. do yourself a favor, take excellent notes or record your conversation yeah. and get contracts. And, and, and it's not, it's not rude or manipulative to, to tell someone. I mean, there's been times whenever, uh, you know, we'll set a phone or something on the table and hit record and say, Hey, we're going to record this mainly so we can just go back mm-hmm. and, um, and take more notes. Cause like, I want to be present in this conversation. So I'm not going to take a lot of notes. Right. We want to, look at each other eye to eye and we want to have this meeting, I will be playing this video back or this audio. So that way, you know, I can then take notes based on that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that going about it in a, in that way and then storing that and just keeping that creative file, you know, that this is this client here's and never throw it back in their face. It should just be used so that you can review what you said. Right. Like that's the only purpose that we use it for. We use it for, you know, going back and reviewing notes that we didn't take because we like to be present. Or if there's a situation that I'm struggling with and I feel like I'm being a bad person, it's helpful for me to go back and listen to and say, okay, what I said, I'm doing. Yeah. I'm, I'm living up to my word because that's that's what I want to make sure always, that I'm living up to my word. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyway, and I think that... Uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, do those things to protect yourself, to, you know, to help you not have to get into those situations to begin with. And second, that accountability partner should be there to help. And this could be a different person because you need to find someone with kind of skills and that you trust mm-hmm. to be able just to talk about it and just say, this is how I'm feeling. I feel attacked or I'm feeling like a failure, like a failure or like I'm manipulating these clients or like I'm letting someone down and you need that person who you value their opinion. Um, can look at it objectively. Not yeah. And, and look at it and just say like, you know, hopefully they're the kind of person and y'all have that relationship where, you know, they can tell you like you are being irrational mm-hmm. or, Hey, you know, you really need to, you're completely justified, but let's be right. gracious about it. Right. And let's, let's just work this. Let's, let's play devil's advocate. And let's say like, maybe they're looking at it from this angle. Like, could you see where maybe that's right. where they're getting this information from or where they believe that they, they are in the right or, you know, things of those natures. And so I think that, you know, having somebody who can, who can be honest with you is, is going to be very beneficial in your business because it's going to happen, mm-hmm. you know? And I mean, I'm no, I'm not necessarily a people pleaser, but I never like anyone to be unhappy with a service that we've provided. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I typically don't let it take up mental space after the fact. Um, 
And so, you know, I think that having somebody empathetic towards, you know, understanding that they may not be a people pleaser, but they can understand why it would bother the people pleaser or why it matters to them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important because, you know, I mean, how long can you keep that up? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen, I've worked with people, for people who are people pleasers and, you know, it's always in my, in my experience, they've always been a scramble to get that last dollar or to get this last bit because they give away everything. Mm -hmm. And because there's no structure there or because there's no, you know, guidelines for like, Hey, we don't refund this or Mm -hmm. yes, we refund it. But a lot of times people open their mouth and they talk before they either consult with someone who maybe their business partner, maybe their accountant, you know, but they're just like, yeah, we'll get you a refund next week. Well, you may not have the means to refund next week. And now you just put yourself in a position as a people pleaser. You thought you were being helpful by telling them a date, but what would have been the most helpful is yes. You know, we will, we will, we'll get you a, a refund issued. However, I need to talk to my account. I need to talk to my so-and-so and and then I'll get back to you and let you know because it may be 30 days. Like there's nowhere unless you, you know, someone messed up and put all refunds are due within seven days, you know, or something of that nature. There's no law that I'm aware of that states like if you say that you're going to issue a refund, it has to be within this time frame, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, I mean, as long as there's nothing in writing, don't feel like, you know, you have, well, I'll get that team 48 hours. Why? Mm-hmm. Just because you want to please them and you want to, like, I couldn't make you happy over here, so I'm going to make you happy with a refund. Mm-hmm. You think that's going to change anything about them? Like, hey, they're not great to work with, but they will issue a refund real fast. Mm-hmm. Like, no. And so I think that having someone to also hold you accountable in that area and just saying, like, just sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. Mm-hmm just stop talking you know and don't tell people don't promise deadlines don't promise when you can issue a refund or how soon you can have something done before talking to people especially if other people are going to be helping you in in doing the task yeah so because then you know they may have had something promising what a renewal rate's going to be when you don't actually know or guaranteeing a specific interest profit when you really don't know yeah well I mean I've worked with people that you know, they would sit there and be talking with the client and the client, you know, oh, I'd really love to have this done in you know, the next couple of weeks. And it's, oh, yeah, yeah, we can get that done. And then as soon as we walk out, it's, oh, my gosh, there's just another thing on the thing on the plate to do. And, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh, like we're already so swamped. And then why did you just agree to a timeline without discussing anything? Or they come back and, you know, we have so and so wants this done in two weeks. And it's like, well, we already have all this other stuff booked out. Well, I already told them, well, that's your fault, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that people pleasing side can come out in so many areas. And, and typically in my experience, the people pleaser gets themselves into more situations that will give their people pleasing anxiety levels, such a raise Mm -hmm. by their own doing. Right. You know, and I typically try, if it's a situation where I know my people pleasing buttons have been pushed, I typically try and take at least a day, if not two, so that my anxiety of not pleasing, like the expectation of me not pleasing them and the anxiety that comes with that can lower because it's going to dissipate over time. And so even though sending the email or making the phone call or having that conversation still might suck, it doesn't hurt as bad or it's, it's just different because now I don't have the anxiety and the disappointment at the same level. Right. The anxiety's kind of come down a little bit. The disappointment is still just as high, but I don't have all of that emotion driving behind it. Right. Well, and if you're not, you know, it probably helps with not creating that neural pathway because when you're, you know, when you get news, say, from somebody who's not happy, your cortisol level is going to shoot up. Mm-hmm. Well, then if you take immediate action, Anytime your cortisol levels shoot up, you are going to feel this need to action. Mm-hmm. And so, 
by giving yourself time to let those chemicals dissipate, mm -hmm. you're not going to have this immediate knee-jerk reaction that says, mm -hmm. someone's not happy, I have to fix it. Yeah. I have to answer. I, I have to do something. exit, fight, or flight before I respond. Right. Because the client's also going to get treated better and the email's going to be worded properly. And right. like there's so many positive things that come. And what's funny is the people-pleasing side of me says, well, how dare you wait two days to respond to that email when you already knew what you wanted to say day one. Right. But well, I, I can't respond. I can't treat them how I want to treat them when I'm in fight or flight mode. Yeah. Well, and sometimes it's like, you, you know, I mean, even you've read me emails before when you haven't even read the whole thing yet. Yeah. You, you get halfway through it and then you just get triggered right. into this panic. this panic of like they're not happy. And then it's like, well, what what did they say about that? Well, I don't know. I haven't finished it. You know, and so it's it's having the discipline to, to get all the way through the problem and then to allow yourself time to process because it may not be as bad as initially you thought, you know, and, and then having someone else read it in a different tone because you may be reading it in a tone of defensiveness. And in reality, they were just trying to be helpful with, Right. Feedback, you know, and so, you know, it, it's just, it's important to have those kinds of checks and balances that you'll learn as you do it. But I think so much of what we're doing now, and I mean, you and I are working on it and I'm extremely um, into learning how to be um, self-aware, you know, self-aware of how am I acting? What are my reactions right now? How do I want to react versus how do I react? And, you know, just being mindful of understanding that, hey, you're, you're doomsdaying over here because, you know, these few things aren't going right or they're not going how you think they should be going. And just being aware that, you know, this is a, this is a thought. This is not reality. Mm -hmm. And so while it may feel like reality, it feels like it because this is what my mind is obsessed with. And so it will, it'll make it happen if I can continue to obsess about it. So how do I get out of this? How do I reframe what it is I'm going through? And so I just, I, I believe that doing some inward self observance and looking at, you know, what are my behaviors when I get these kinds of responses or these kinds of replies, mm -hmm. and then just what kind of checks and balances can you put in place? What can you do? Do you just tell yourself, I never respond to those kind of emails within 24 hours, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that by doing that, it's going to give you the space to start working on how you're going to respond, how you're going to deal with those right. situations. So you're not just knee jerk reaction out of someone's not happy. I have to make it better mm -hmm. because it's not always your responsibility when someone's unhappy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I mean, people suck. I'm so, you know, they're not always deserving of your, of your input, you know, when they're not happy. Like sometimes people are just unhappy. Just let them be, you know, let them self soothe. <laughs> first but episode I think that'll work thanks for tuning in Thanks for tuning in to The Velvet Ventures. If you'd like more information about who we are, what we do, or you want to follow us or any of our companies, then feel free to check out the link below. Other than that, thank you so much to our sponsors for making this episode possible. See you next time.